<laughs> Here we go. Can you hear me? All right. Let's see if it's live now. Got to wait 10 seconds, I guess. There we go. OK, here we go. All right, so let's try this again. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on synchronous motor protection, electrical signature analysis, and the GE869 motor protection relay setup. My name is Eduardo Iglesias, and on behalf of the GE grid automation team supporting this event today, I would like you to thank uh, to thank you for taking time to participate in this session. We have a very ambitious uh, agenda for today, so I'll just take a minute to go over some of the housekeeping items. Uh, first, I would like to uh, let you know that this session is being recorded. The video recording will be available for on-demand viewing to you for the next 90 days or so. And the uh, recording can be accessed using the same link that you receive in your email confirmation. Uh, the session is muted, so please use the chat bo box to send us uh, your questions. And uh, please feel free to send them at any time during the presentation. Uh, within 24 hours, we'll email you a copy of the presentation so you can uh, use it as future reference. And if you need a certificate for the, your participation, please feel free to email me after the session and I will get it out to you within the next, within the next 48 hours or so. Uh, with that said, I'll let, I'll let Christine Kreitz, uh, which is one of our senior application engineers, uh, presenting the, uh, the uh, covering the topics today, take over. Christine? Thanks, Eduardo. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I know there is a lot of webinars going on these days, so we sure do appreciate your continued interest. Um, for those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Christine Kreitz. I'm one of GE's PNC application engineers based out of the Cleveland, Ohio area. And generally, you'll find me throughout the Midwest states and occasionally a bit westward and down through Texas. Uh, on the line, we also have my colleague Paul Smith um, and Mike Ramlachin, who's going to be helping to answer the Q&As that you guys submit today. Um, so we have a couple of exciting topics to talk about today. Uh, both topics are specific, more advanced features and selectable options in our newer 869 motor protection relay. These would be in addition to the standard motor protection functions that the 869 already has that Paul covered a couple weeks ago, if you caught his section. Um, the first topic we'll go over is the synchronous motor protection option, what that looks like hardware wise, and some of the key protection functions associated with that. And then after that, we'll spend a good chunk of time on the electrical signature analysis option for advanced monitoring, the theory behind it, what we can do, what we can see, and how to configure it. And then towards the end, if we have time, I'll do a quick dive into the Enervista setup software and a review of some of the basic procedures. OK, so let's first take a look at synchronous motor protection. Just a quick recap of the basic construction of a motor. Here we have an induction motor, which most of you are probably more familiar with since these are much more common. An induction motor uses the basic concept of electromagnetic induction. The stator is constructed of several different windings arranged in pairs per phase, um, with each pair located on opposite ends and connected in series to each other. As we pass current through these stator windings, for each of these three phase pairs, the current signal on either side is at the opposite part of its cycle. And then each phase or each pair is shifted by 120 degrees. This current produces an electromagnetic magnetic force and the current is continuously alternating. So in effect, what we end up with is at any given time, Half the stator will consist of north poles, and the other half will consist of south poles. And this magnetism will be continuously rotating as the current shifts. Now, the rotor 
uh, most often is constructed of a cage that includes shorting plates on either side and rotor bars uh, that run the length of the shaft. So when we energize the stator, the electromagnetic field that it produces essentially cuts through these rotor bars, which induces a current, which effectively magnetizes the rotor. Magnetically, you end up with something like this, where the stator has a north and a south pole, and the rotor has an induced opposite north and south pole, and the force of attraction and repulsion between them, which again is continuously changing rotationally, causes a torque that spins the rotor and drives the load. Now here we're showing these poles exactly locked in, but in reality, the rotor is following the stator's lead and there's going to be some inerrant, inherent inertia. So the rotor will always lag a little bit behind the stator field. This lag in speed is what we call the slip. So an induction motor will always have some value of slip. Now, when we come to synchronous motors, the construction of the stator is similar. We still have stator windings, not shown here. Um, and they still have three-phase current magneti magnetizing them. Um, the big difference is in the construction and operation of the rotor. Um, the rotor of a synchronous motor usually has poles, like you see here, that are physically uh, sticking out with windings actually wrapped around them. Um, so here, so these rotor windings are connected to a DC source like we show here. The purpose of this DC source is to maintain the magnetism for the rotor windings. So here we're not relying on the stator to magnetize the rotor during operation. The DC supply is adjusted to keep the rotor windings magnetically locked in to the stator. Um, so that they rotate together in unison. So in this case, the rotor operates at synchronous speed matched with the stator. There's no slip and the speed is generally not affected by loading, which is one of the main benefits to using this type of a motor. One of the caveats with a synchronous motor though is that it's not self-starting. The DC supply is fixed and it can't produce any starting torque. It just locks the rotor in once it's already moving. Um, but there are different ways to get the motor started. Some people use a prime mover coupled with the shaft. Most people, uh, most often what we see is that uh, it'll be started as an induction motor. So to start as an induction motor, the DC excitation system is disconnected via this field application system. The field contactors keep the circuit open. While there's usually another normally closed contactor here with a field discharge resistor connected in series. Um, the purpose of this field discharge resistor um, is to give a path whenever the DC field is inactive so that the current induced in the field windings um, by the stator is limited. Um, otherwise, it could potentially damage the windings. So, Procedurally, we energize the stator as usual. The rotor typically will have some form of a lightweight squirrel, squirrel cage so that it can catch that induced current and magnetize in that magnetic torque to start the rotation. Once that rotor comes up to speed, as it would in, an, in a normal induction motor, usually somewhere around 95% speed with a 5% slip, then we close in this DC excitation system. Um, we open this series field contactor, um, and then that DC supply is closed in and provides that extra little bit of torque to eliminate the slip, and it locks in the rotor to the stator. And then again, moving forward as is required, the DC supply can be adjusted to maintain synchronism or to allow for other conditions which we'll touch on in a few minutes. Now, as far as the DC excitation system goes, there's two different types of constructions. There's the brush type, where the DC excitation system is a separate stationary device. The DC is transferred to the rota, rotor via slip rings, 
that are touching the stationary brushes as it, as it rotates. The other option is a brushless motor, uh, where the actual exciter is assembled on the shaft, like you see here. The, the DC supply itself is stationary and is connected to an AC alternator, this smaller ring that you see here, which remains stationary as well around the rotating shaft. Um, the alternator creates a three-phase AC signal, and it's usually magnetically coupled with the larger ring, which is a silicon rectifier. And by means of this coupling, it transfers the current. Then this rectifier converts this AC signal to DC and supplies it to the rotor field winding. Because of the power electronics, the brushless setup tends to be a bit more expensive up front, but in the long run, because there's less maintenance since you don't have brushes or any uh, real friction-based system that wears out over time, um, you do save a little bit of money on maintenance with the brushless motor. But for the most part, what we see generally more of is the brush type synchronous motor. Just to give you a visual example, here we have a GE synchronous motor. You can see the rotor has actual poles sticking out internally with windings wrapped around them. And then the stator looks pretty typical. So we have an idea of how a synchronous motor works. Next, let's take a look at how we protect them. Traditionally, we would need two devices to fully protect and control a synchronous motor. Most motor protection relays like our 369, 469, or basic 869 have functions that are focused more on monitoring and protecting only the stator. Functions like the thermal model, for example, are only based on the line current that the relay sees. Nothing from the rotor is directly taken into account. For an induction motor, this is all we really need. So typically, we have one of these relays for stator protection if we have a synchronous motor. And then to provide the field protection and start sequence control, you know, the controller that decides when the DC field can be applied and signals the contactors. For that, we would use our SPM relay, which was a dedicated rotor protection and control relay for synchronous applications. Um, most often, what we tend to see installed is a 469 relay with an SPM directly beside it. So that's what we see here. We have the 469 relay on the top and the SPM relay on the bottom. The 469 would have the usual line current and voltage connections going to it. And then the SPM would receive signals from the field. Um, a DC CT would provide the current signal. Um, in the case of the SPM, we had a calibration module in between to process the signals. And the voltages across the field windings and also at the exciter itself would be brought to the relay by way of this voltage divider network, which just steps down the signals for relay processing. Um, back in 2013 or so, we released the 869 relay, which is the successor to the 469. Um, and it can do all the same functions as the 469 and more. Um, we also added the SPM option to it. Um, so now everything that the, 86, the 469 and the SPM did, we can do that directly in one box. Um, it's this, the wiring is very similar. You still have your usual line current and voltage signals coming to the relay. You'd still use a DC CT to provide the field current signal minus the calibration module. We do that processing directly in the 869. Um, and down here, basically the same thing. We have an external voltage divider card that steps down the DC voltages and then they're brought to the 869. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about this hardware in a moment. First, let's go over some of the key protection and control elements that the 869 with the SPM option offers. Some of these like start sequence control, incomplete start and power factor regulation were brought over from the SPM in addition to other protection elements like loss of excitation, out of step and so on. But we also added some new more advanced features that I want to touch on as well, like stabilizing and auto loading and unloading, uh, squirrel cage, rotor thermal protection, speed biasing and power factor protection enhancements. Before we go into detail, I think it's important to note that there's different stages between the motor state of operation, which is at the top, what the relay registers, which is in the middle here, and exactly what protection elements are active and inactive during these states shown at the bottom. So first, when the motor has no uh, no line supply feeding it, the breaker or contactor is open, the relay simply registers the motor is in stop state, and during that time the only protection that's active are the voltage related ones. Everything that has to do with current is non-operational during this motor stop state. Then when the Supply current is first supplied. We see the typical inrush current. At this point, the relay registers motor starting state. Then when the current drops down to a normal level, when it's up to speed, the relay registers motor running state. The running state as in running in induction mode, not that it's running as a synchronous motor yet. So during both the motor starting and induction mode running states, um, the relay has the start sequence controls running as well as any enabled short circuit protection and the three thermal model elements, the current based stator thermal model, the RTD bias thermal model, and the new speed dependent thermal model that we'll talk about in a moment. Everything related to conditions that could happen during steady state running, like loss of excitation, out of step, power factor protection, all of these are temporarily blocked during this time. So up to this point, we do not have any DC field applied. After this point, when the motor is up to speed, the start sequence control will determine the appropriate time to apply the field and it'll trigger that application. So that's this point here. As soon as the field is applied, there's a stabilization period. The relay goes into synchronous motor stabilizing mode. Then once stabilized, the load will be connected and then the relay will go into synchronous motor running mode. So at this point, when we apply the DC field, um, all the usual protection elements are enabled and those related to starting like the start sequence control and the speed dependent thermal protection bec become inactive. And then from here on onward, um, we're in normal synchronous motor running mode and the relay continues to monitor for an overload or an abnormal condition. Diving into a little bit more detail, let's first take a look at what's involved in start sequence control. Again, like I mentioned, one of the main functions that's required of a synchronous motor controller is the start sequence control. This function is what monitors the speed or slip and decides exactly when to apply the DC field to achieve synchronization. So the 869 can do this start sequence control two ways. Here on the left, I'm showing a screenshot of the 869 setting menu in the InterVista setup software. Under the control option, 
motor starting, you can find the SM start sequence control option. If we open it, we'll find a settings window that looks a little bit like this. And one of the settings is for the mode. If we select the mode to be slip frequency based, then we need to set the sync slip percent setting. This would be the slip at which the motor is considered synchronized. So we can look at the motor data sheets, for example, this one on the right. And on the far left, we have the acceleration curve that shows the time versus percent of speed. And at the very end point of this curve is when the motor is considered up to speed. So in this example, that's about 97%, which means our sync slip would need to be set to 3%. So when the relay measures that the slip has reduced to 3%, it'll trigger a closure of the field application contacts to bring in the DC supply. The other option is to control based on time. In this case, we need to set the field application relay delay to the time indicated at the end point of the acceleration curve when it indicates it's up to speed. So in this case, that's about 14 seconds. So after, so 14 seconds after we register a motor starting state, the 869 will assume the motor's up to speed and then it'll close the field contacts. Now, a key thing to note here is that the slip frequency mode is only applicable to brush type motors since we need to be able to measure the speed to be able to calculate the slip which can only be done if we have a measurement of the voltage of the actual field winding. And in the case of the brushless motor, which we saw a minute ago, um, which has the excitation system mounted directly on the rotor and is rotating, we don't have that measurement available. And this is pretty typical of most synchronous motor controllers. If you don't have that measurement, um, then you simply choose time-based and set it based on your data sheet. Now, in terms of what the field current looks like during this process, you can see here that the motor is coming up to speed. The current is AC due to the induction from the stator. Right after we closed in the DC supply here, there's a stabilizing time while the current levels off from AC to DC. And during this time, there could be some unusual oscillations. So to prevent a relay misoperation during this time, we monitor this oscillatory period and we block the protection functions that look at the field current. At the point when the field current levels off, the relay registers that we're in normal synchronized running mode. And if you choose, you can assign a relay output and use the built-in auto loading feature to automatically close this output and trigger application of the load. Um, with this, if you choose to do it this way, we can also automatically shed the load if we see the field has been removed or if the motor pulls out of sync. In terms of protection elements, one of the key new features we added is the squirrel cage speed dependent thermal model. The idea with this is that, like I mentioned earlier, most synchronous motors have a squirrel cage winding that facilitates the motor starting in induction mode while it comes up to speed. Since this cage isn't designed to be used during running operation, it's usually made of a lighter material and it could be vulnerable to overheating. So if the motor stalls during acceleration or if the motor runs out of sync for too long with no DC supply, we could run the risk of damaging that cage winding. So the intent with the squirrel cage speed dependent thermal protection is to look at the motor speed during acceleration 
and estimate the cage's thermal state based on how long it's been operating at that speed. For this estimation, we use the, these speed dependent overload curves that dictate to the relay what the thermal limit is, i.e. when to issue an overload trip. It's very similar in concept to the traditional thermal model element, if you're familiar with that. Um, we calculate a separate speed dependent thermal capacity use percentage. And if that TCU percent reaches 100%, then we trip on overload. Again, this one is only active during the acceleration phase. And if we see a pullout condition or are trying to resync. And because we need to calculate the speed in this case, which requires again a field voltage measurement, um, this particular element can only be used on brush type motors. Once again, here showing the settings as you would see in the InterVista setup software. So under protection group one motor, you'll see SMSC speed dependent thermal model. The key settings that we need to consider are the time speed curve number and the stall time at 0% speed. On the right, again, we have the 869's available curve selections. Um, these curves indicate the thermal limit as a function of the speed versus how long it's allowed to run expressed as a multiple of the allowable stall time. So what that means is if our, if our motor data sheets indicates an allowable stall time of 10 seconds, then we program this stall time setting as 10 seconds. Then we choose a curve number based on how long our data sheet shows it should take the motor to exceed acceleration to 50% speed. The curve names here um, are actually a multiple of the motor stall time at 50% speed, so at this point here. So if we draw a line at 50%, you can see curve three, is at a multiple of three. Curve two at 50% is at a multiple of about two, and so on for the other two. So let's say, for example, we have a stall time of 10 seconds and we decide to choose curve number three. So we program SPM three for the curve. This would mean that the allowable runtime at 50% speed would be three times our stall time of 10 seconds, so 30 seconds. So basically, this is just calculating it out here. We have runtime over stall time per, per what we have here equals three. Solving for the runtime, we have 30 seconds. So this is saying operating at a speed of 50%, we have 30 seconds until we trip on overload. If you have your data sheet acceleration curves, you can see what the typical 50% acceleration time required is and kind of work backwards from that to get an estimate of what curve you should pick to fall above that. Um, based on the curve you choose and the set stall time, the relay establishes an acceleration schedule to estimate the thermal state uh, at any given speed and runtime. In here, there's also a setting for voltage dependent function that can be enabled or disabled. Um, my, many motors involve reduced voltage starting. So in this scenario, the acceleration torque is reduced compared to full voltage start, which means it takes longer for the motor to accelerate. But there is also less inrush current, so the heating rate is reduced. So when we enable this VD function option, the 869 is allowed to take advantage of the motor's extended stall time so that it can accelerate to full speed over a longer period of time without tripping. <laughs> 
the factor that the acceleration torque is reduced is technically the square of the ratio of the reduced voltage to full voltage and the heating rate is proportional to the square of the starting current. So in other words, since the motor inrush current is, re is reduced proportionally to the voltage reduction, we've come up with this K factor calculation that basically derates the time speed curves based on the level of uh, voltage reduction, and it increases the allowable runtime until overload at any given speed. So on the right here, you can see the standard uh, SPM overload curves shifted upwards. Just a quick note here, in the normal thermal model element, we've added a set point for speed biasing. If you enable this, the normal current-based thermal model will incorporate the speed-dependent model into the algorithm's decision to trip on overload. This is really similar to this RTD biasing function, if you're familiar with that. So the current-based thermal model the RTD-based thermal model, and now the speed-based thermal model will all calculate an estimation separately of the motor's thermal capacity use percentage. If and only if the overload pickup current level has been exceeded, then the relay will look at all three of these estimates and operate based on the worst case one. So if we see an unusually hot RTD because of something like uh, a high ambient temperature will operate on that quicker. And similarly, if we see um, an estimate that the squirrel cage winding has reached its thermal limit, we'll trip based on that first. Since this speed-based thermal model is only active during starting uh, induction running mode or resync mode, this doesn't affect the normal running mode thermal model operation. But if you're already using the speed-based thermal model protection anyway, it doesn't hurt to enable this option here. It's just a little bit added protection. The last protection element I wanted to highlight is the power factor element. We know that the load, the excitation current, the stator current, and the power factor are all closely related. The motor data sheets usually express this relationship via something like these V curves shown on the right. This is just a general example. Um, and this is just a plot of the stator current versus the field excitation for different load levels. So here we're showing no load, half load, and full load. The minimum stator current for each load level is that unity power factor, which is this bottom point for each curve. Now, if you decrease the field excitation, the stator current will increase and the power factor will become lagging. So this area is the lagging power factor. If you increase the field excitation, the stator current will still increase but this time with a leading power factor. So this side is the leading power factor section. And th this part here is the concept for synchronous motors being used unloaded as synchronous condensers for power factor correction. So for any load, the power factor is the ratio of this minimum stator current point to what the stator current actually is per what the field excitation is. So the idea is we generally are okay with operating to some extent in this leader leading power factor direction. Protection wise, we often won't trip on that unless it's severe. What we're mainly worried about is if we have too large a step in supply voltage or an excessive change in load, um, the excitation of either the stator or rotor windings could swing too far off from the other and break the coupling or fall out of sync. Uh, since the excitation 
either way affects the uh, stator and field current, which in turn affects the power factor. We can monitor the power factor to detect uh, any sort of a pullout condition. We would want to operate if the power factor falls too far to the left here in the lagging direction. So the power factor monitoring function in 869 is very similar to what we had in the SPM, but we added an additional setting for the power factor mode. If we set this mode to ride through, the relay will not immediately remove the DC supply. We'll attempt to wait and see if this was just a temporary dip. If the motor didn't completely pull out, it's usually able to recover itself using the squirrel cage in induction mode to come back up to speed. But if the power factor doesn't recover after the set time delay, then the motor has likely fallen too far to sink and will trip it offline. On the other hand, if this PF mode we select to be resync, um, then we'll immediately remove the field and we will shed the load. We'll let the motor run in induction mode to try and resync. Then upon resync, we'll reapply the field and the load. Again, if there's no resync seen before this time delay expires, then we'll trip the motor offline. So which option you choose here would probably depend how expensive the motor is, if it's driving a critical load, and if fluctuations in your power factor are frequent or considered normal in your application. Resync is definitely a safer option, but it does have a greater likelihood of affecting your process. Last quick note here on features. We do still have the automatic power factor regulation function that the SPM had on the 869. This feature uses a closed loop transfer function that continuously looks at the phase angle error, which would be the target power factor set point compared to the real time calculated value. And based on this, it'll output a signal accordingly to adjust the field excitation. Um, with the 869, we do have a wider selection of output signal types now to accommodate more excitation systems. So you can choose a voltage signal in the range of 0 to 10 volts, minus 10 to 10 volts, or a current signal um, of 0 to 20 milliamps or 4 to 20 milliamps. And on the right here, we're showing the 869 relays wiring diagram with the power factor regulator output on the right of the synchronous motor block option. So you can wire and set some of this as highlighted, but the exact tuning of this function is usually required to be done via testing during the initial startup period. So we've covered some of the key elements specific to protection and control of a synchronous motor provided with the 869 synchronous motor option. Now just a few points on the hardware aspect of it. To select this option to start with, there is one code in the model number that you need to specify. In the second phase current option, slot K, you can either choose P5, which gives you a second set of CT inputs that can be used for differential CTs. This does not have a synchronous motor option. Or you can choose these C5 or D5 options, which include the synchronous motor option. So th these two options specifically indicate that you want the synchronous motor option. There's nowhere else in the order code where you specify it. With them, you get this second CT bank for differential, and you'll also get another set of inputs for all the synchronous motor inputs that we talked about. The selection here is based on whether your DCCT will have a DC milliamp output 
for a volts DC output. Just a note, when you order this option, we do provide the voltage divider card to step down the field inputs, but you do need to separately get a new DC CT. We, we do have specific ranges that we can provide to you to assist in the DC CT selection, or we can re recommend to you a specific model, or we can even provide it additionally in the package. Um, the selection of what type of output signal that you would choose depends on your installation requirements. Um, typically, if the CT leads only need to be run a short distance, then the volts DC signal might be okay. Otherwise, it might be susceptible to voltage drop from the cable resistance and noise interference. Um, both of which can affect the accuracy of the signal. If possible, we usually suggest to use a DC milliamp signal since it's not as effective as affected by the cabling or the noise. And it also provides an ad added bonus for troubleshooting. So if you're using a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, if that output showing 4 milliamps at the relay, we definitely know it's a zero reading, but if at the relay you're seeing zero milliamps, then we know for sure there's probably an issue with the CT cabling itself. So that's very helpful for troubleshooting purposes. Again, just to give you an idea of the wiring to the relay, these left three terminal blocks. Um, the two in slot J and the first in slot K. These were existing input options for your standard uh, VT and line CT connection and then your differential CTs on the neutral side. What we've added with the synchronous motor option is this input block here on the right where we have inputs for your field winding voltage taken across the discharge resistor. Um, and your exciter voltage, again, routed through this voltage divider uh, network that steps down the signals to relay processing level. Then we have the input for the DCCT. And again, the output for power factor regulation. And just to reiterate, Here's a closer look of the terminals. This is the synchronous motor option terminal block here. Um, the first two inputs again for the field winding voltage, which is measure, measured across the discharge resistor. Um, the second set for the exciter voltage and the set highlighted purple to take the DCCT field current measurement. So this would be a fully wired application for a brush type motor. Like I mentioned earlier, for brushless applications, the excitation system is fixed and rotating on the shaft. So we have no real way of um, getting fixed wiring to measure the rotor winding voltage. In this case, we'd leave the signal out, nothing connected here. Um, but we'd still connect the rest as usual. Again, the main implications of this is that um, the only implications are on elements that rely on this specific measurement, like the start sequence control, um, speed option, the speed dependent thermal model, um, and a couple other options. Quick installation example. This is from one of our first 869 SPM installations done, I think at Dow Chemical in Texas, if I'm not mistaken. They originally had an old 139 relay uh, that did stator protection and an SPM relay beside it for control. Um, they were able to retrofit this entire panel with a new 869 with the SPM option same panel, um, 
and now they can do everything in one device instead of two. This is even easier if you have an existing 469 relay because the 869 is the exact same dimensions as the 469. So you can take the 469 and SPM out, cover the SPM hole, and place the 869 directly in the exact same uh, cutout that the 469 was in. And then, of course, we have uh, additional programmable push buttons on the 869 and a nice large display now that shows all your basic information directly on one screen. Um, there's also a customizable single line diagram option when you specify the model number. So if you want to add additional values to an existing screen, like these highlighted ones here, um, you can do that. And you have five additional blank pages to work with as well. So retrofit or green application, there's much more flexibility now available to reduce the number of separate devices required, uh, the number of control knobs or buttons, and the number of indicators required to complete your system. So that concludes the synchronous motor part of our seminar today. Uh, let's take a look here. Again, just a reminder, if you have any questions that come up, feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. Um, I see there's already uh, been a, a large group of questions that have come in that the guys have answered, which is great. Keep them coming. Uh, Mike and Paul will help answer them along the way, along with Eduardo. Um, and at the end, we'll take a look through and see if we have any additional to add to that. So switching gears a little, the next thing we wanted to cover today is electrical signature analysis. Again, this is a specific option in the 869 motor protection relay that can be selected via the model number. Just for some background, when we designed the 869 and thought about what kind of features we can add to the relay to add value, we kind of took a step back and looked more holistically at what kind of features statistically tend to occur in a motor. Or, sorry, what kind of failures statistically tend to occur in a motor. Um, a, a traditional motor protection relay like a 369 or 469 that uses a thermal, thermal model to estimate the temperature state of the motor really only provides stator protection. You know, because unless you have RTDs, the only thing we're really considering is the amount of current flowing through the stator. So we can protect against things like overloads or short circuits. Um, but you can see at both below and above 4 kV, we're still missing out on a lot of failures. Below 4 kV, our protection only really covers this blue part here for stator failures. We don't see over 50% of the typical failures that occur. We might catch these eventually, but by the time it gets bad enough that the RTDs would pick it up or her short happens, it would probably be way too late. Above 4 kV, stator failures make up a big chunk, but here we're also talking about issues with the foundation, with the core laminations, and the mechanical makeup in general. And again, you can see pretty decent chunks for the rotor and bearing failures that we traditionally are not detecting at all. So the question was, what can we do to account for some of these other failures in our relays? The goal with any protection or preventative analytics is usually to detect and isolate problems as quick as possible because the quicker we catch it, the less damage the motor will incur, which means the easier it'll be to fix it, the cheaper it is to fix, and the lesser amount of time is required to fix it. Of course, everyone needs to do some normal maintenance once in a while. We can't avoid that. But where we'd fall into in this scale is hopefully to catch things near this lower repair stage where things like an early bearing failure can be replaced in a matter of hours before anything's really burned up. 
um, winding or rewinding or replacing a motor typically is pretty costly and a lot more time consuming than just doing a minor repair. And we all know that time is money, especially if the motor is running a process. So the point here is that traditional motor protection relays are reactive, the elements in the middle section here. They operate in response to a problem that has already largely happened. Some relays do have more advanced elements that can detect things like winding turn faults, but it still leaves gaps that we aren't covering. So moving forward, we wanted a relay that's more proactive, something that can detect incipient faults and send you a flag before the issue is even considered a failure so that you can perform preventative maintenance instead of repairs. And that's where the idea of incorporating this motor current signature analysis, or as we call it, electrical signature analysis function comes in. So what is ESA exactly? ESA isn't a new technology. The principle of it has been around for quite some time. Some of you might be familiar with things like PDMA testing, for example. This is basically the same concept. This whole thing is based upon the idea that every motor has its own sort of a fingerprint. That fingerprint is the makeup of the frequencies hidden within the stator current. So if you take the current signal, transform it from the time versus current domain to frequency versus the magnitude of those frequencies, otherwise known as doing the Fourier transform, you get something like this, where you can see the largest component of the signal is the 60 hertz fundamental, but you also have all these other components of varying smaller magnitudes. And in a perfect world, you would just have a 60 hertz signal and all of the rest of these would be flatlined. But in reality, every motor is built slightly different at a mag magnified level. There's going to be some sort of normal sounds, normal operating vibrations, and the exact relationship between the rotor and how it rotates within the stator, the current modulation between them, all of this will affect the makeup and the magnitudes of the harmonics that you would see here. With that being said, absolutely any physical anomalies that occur will in some way affect the magnitudes of these harmonics, depending what the problem is, where it's located, and how exactly it affects the air gap and the modulation between the rotor and stator. And based on the motor's characteristics, we can actually calculate and identify what frequencies uh, these different failures would appear at. That's the whole basis of ESA. We see what the normal spectrum looks like. We identify where different physical faults may show up. And then we monitor those frequencies and issue a flag if there's a significant change in those magnitudes. And so here we're basically saying the same thing, but in more scientific terms, under normal conditions, the air gap and the flux uh, all the way around the periphery of the rotor and stator should be even and symmetrical. Any physical anomalies will affect the magnetic flux in some way, which will reflect back onto the stator current as noise at specific predictable frequencies. Again, the concept itself is not new. Some people have a third party company come in and do testing where they initially take a baseline reading to see what the normal healthy values are. Then they come back periodically to take a sample and do a comparative analysis to see if anything is changing. Or there are systems like this that can be permanently installed and do this monitoring continuously. Either of these options can be fairly expensive, but the measurements and analysis are usually extremely detailed. So the idea with us integrating 
the ESA concept into the 869 is not necessarily to replace either of these options. Again, these traditional current signature analysis systems are very detailed. But if you already have or will be putting in a motor protection relay like an 869 anyway, adding just a software option to something you'll be installing regardless is probably much more convenient and cost effective. So we in the 869 look at the phase A current that's already being brought to the relay. There's no additional wiring or installation requirements, just the software option adder and a few extra settings. The analysis itself that you get from it is not as detailed as the traditional systems, but the intent is for it to be a simpler alternative option for motors that you would still consider to be significant and you would like to have some sort of monitoring on, but you also might not want to shell out a whole bunch of money for a, a full-blown system or keep relying on paying someone to come in and help you analyze it. So the, the 869 is meant to be an alternative to these. OK, so let's take a look at what ESA looks like specifically in the 869 relay. And just a quick note, if you're already familiar with this ESA function or you've seen one of our previous presentations on it, you might notice some of the details have changed. We've had ESA out for a few years now with a good number of installations running it. We've collected the feedback and the data from them. And I believe last week, early last week, we released 8 Series Firmware 2.7, which incorporates some significant changes to the way we do ESA to make it more inclusive across the range of types of motors, uh, makes it more accurate and easier for you to implement. So as we go along, I'll be pointing out where these changes are just for reference. So in the 8.6 sign, we separate the ESA analysis into three main categories where everything bucketed into these categories would have similar characteristics and these types of fault would show up at similar fault frequencies. The first category is roller bearing fault. This would be any damage to the inner or outer race or the ball themselves. Specifically, this is applicable to ball bearings. Sleeve bearings are different and currently we don't monitor those. So if you only have sleeve bearings, you can still use ESA, but you'd need to disable this bearing part of it. So basically, a bearing failure causes a vibration, and this vibration is what shows up in the stator current signal. The way that we calculate the bearing fault frequencies is as we see here. I won't go into great depth on the science behind these calculations. If you're interested, we can definitely provide you with more info. But the gist of it is that for bearings, we calculate the equivalent vibration frequency, because if you have a bad bearing, it's going to cause some sort of a physical vibration. Um, we have a different formula for the inner race, outer race, and ball. Um, after we calculate what the equivalent vibration frequencies are, we determine what frequencies this would show up at in the stator current signal down here. So. Here's one thing we've updated in firmware version 2.7. In the older firmware, if you have an existing installation, uh, we would add these vibration frequencies to the line current frequency to get the additive effect of it. The changes in our algorithm, which we'll see in a moment, essentially normalize the input signal that we're processing to the line current so we no longer need to incorporate that factor. So we simply find the vibration frequencies and now we just apply this K factor to them which is equal to one, two, or three and is simply to account for subharmonics of these vibrations. So this is all we do 
in the newer firmware, which is a lot simpler. Um, so in total, we will have uh, nine different potential fault frequencies with all of the combinations of these calculations. In, in the older firmware, it was 18 different frequency calculations. With the updates that we've made, we've cut the numbers of all the calculations for all the, all the categories by half. So instead of 18, we're only needing to look at nine now, which is a lot easier. The second type of issue we can detect with ESA are stator faults. That'd be any damage at all to the insulation, laminations, the frame, or the windings. And you see the predicted fault frequency formula here. Again, this calculation has been updated. Here we take into account the center frequency, which is the rotational frequency multiplied by the number of stator slots, which is from the motor data sheet. Then we plus minus the line frequency to give us a total number of fault frequencies of three. So we're looking at center frequency and then the center frequency plus or minus the line frequency. So we have this one here and then either side here. For the newer firmware, this is the only calculation that we need to do. We're looking at three different frequencies. In the older firmware, we have an additional calculation to this that incorporates this one in addition to um, the rotational frequency sideband. So we used to look at six different fault frequencies. But again, since we've shifted the input signal we're analyzing, now we only need to take into account the stator's center frequency and the line frequency sidebands of it. The third type of fault, free, fault category we can detect is the general category of mechanical faults. This accounts for anything that would cause the air gap to be not totally equal across the periphery of the motor. So basically, the electromagnetic pole is unbalanced. Um, this might be caused by a loose foundation, or it could be that the rotor is rotating off center or rotating kind of wobbly back and forth. This is called centricity. Or it could be an actual shaft misalignment. All of these would cause some sort of a vibration. In terms of the formula for the frequency calculation here, um, this is a big one that we changed. Looks pretty simple here. Um, but the old calculation used to take into account the slip of the motor, which poses a challenge for synchronous motors since the slip is zero, um, and also the number of poles. Again, with this new signal shift that we do, we've simplified this greatly, and we can find these faults basically at the motor's rotational frequency. And then again, three harmonics of it. So where we used to need to look at six frequencies, now we're only looking at three frequencies. And because we don't use the slip, we also support synchronous motors now, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So now that we have an idea how we can predict the potential fault frequencies, uh, let's take a look at how the 869 actually processes all this data and does its analytics. So we're about to get into a lot of details. The long story short version for you to remember of what we do is that we record a baseline of the normal healthy motor frequency spectrum. Then we use the motor data provided to calculate the predicted fault frequencies as we just discussed. Then we continuously monitor these frequencies and compare them to the baseline data to detect when changes start occurring aka when a fault starts. If we detect a large enough change for a long enough period of time, uh, which are two of the key settings that we set, then we alarm on ESA. We don't trip. 
since this is solely meant to be a monitoring element, unless you specifically uh, set it to do otherwise, like if you set it to operate an output contact, um, by default, we just provide a warning and say, hey, something's up. You need to go and take a look at the motor. And the reason for the time delay before we alarm is that we want to make sure that it's a permanent fault and not just a transient. You know, if a, a bearing starts to fail, it's definitely not going to fix itself. But it's not unheard of to have some momentary vibrations here and there. In terms of the actual ESA algorithm, here's the steps that we take broken down. So the first thing we do is a data quality check to make sure we're monitoring a valid signal. We check that the frequency is within plus or minus 5% of nominal, that the voltage is within 10% of nominal. We look at the harmonic distortion to make sure it's not in excess of 5%, uh, that the frequency is not rapidly changing, and that the current unbalance is less than 10%. If any of these points fails, you'll see a data quality check event logged, and the ESA will be suspended until all of these conditions are normal again, and this event clears. So you see data quality check fail, and then after some time, that check fail turned off. With newer firmware versions, we did add a setting where you can choose to disable this data quality check. You might want to do that if the relay doesn't have VTs connected to it, for example. Otherwise, you might have uh, constantly have a data quality check. Um, but in general, it should be on unless you have some sort of special requirement. So the second step we do is the fast Fourier transform to the A phase current signal um, to put it into the frequency domain so that we can see the full spectrum of frequencies that make up the signal. If you're not familiar with looking at the frequency domain, the decibel unit for the magnitude of the frequencies can be a little bit confusing. What the decibel is looking at is just a log based ratio, which provides like a, a number line compression scale so that we can graph a large data variation together. We show this uh, in the, the table that you see to the right here. And what we use is this part from zero to minus 100. We do a normalization in the next step so that what we end up actually looking at, like you see here, is the ratio of the magnitudes at each frequency compared to the fundamental. So the fundamental is at the zero dB point at the top, then all the harmonics are somewhere in comparison to that. Ideally, harmonics are bad and we want them not be present. If the harmonics were not, present in the signal, that'd be equal to the floor value of minus 100 or the bottom. So when you look at this graph later on, all you really need to keep in mind is the idea that the lower the harmonics fall on here, the more negative the decibel reading is, the better it is. The higher it is on the graph, the worse it is and the more distortion it causes to the overall signal. So just keep this in mind when we look at the metering values and the graphs. You want to see lower negative values. So the, the big algorithm update I keep referencing that allows our calculations and analysis to be simplified comes into play in this step. In the older firmware versions, we simply did the normal Fourier transform like you saw in the previous slide, and we did our analysis on that. In firmware version 2.7, we still show you the normal Fourier transform signal on the metering screens because it's visually easier to understand. But in the background, what we actually do to the current signal is we take the, take the transform of the current signal squared 
So what this does is it moves the fundamental signal to DC. A new shifted fundamental signal shows up at two times the line frequency. Um, and what we're left with are the harmonics in the signal shown to the left of that uh, two times the fundamental frequency. So it looks something like this, where at zero hertz at DC, you see a spike for the fundamental. Somewhere along here, you would see the two times fundamental here, uh, which isn't shown. But if a fault were to occur, we could see that fault component spike much, much more magnified. Like we saw, this makes the calculations much simpler and the analysis itself is much more accurate. Again, you won't visually see this in any of the records, but this is what we do in the background. Just to give you an idea, we have done extensive testing during the last year um, on this I squared algorithm. This main test was done by uh, varying the eccentricity of the motors and seeing how the mechanical fault component uh, of the ESA function picked up. We've tested this update on both induction and synchronous motors of varying sizes and VFD driven motors. Uh, we previously did not have ESA certified for use on synchronous motors or VFDs. But with this uh, new algorithm in 2.7 onwards, we do support all of those. You can see on the bottom right here, the results of various tests. And you can see there was a clear distinction between what the relay saw when there was no fault present versus when we induced a fault. So from all of our testing, uh, we find the I squared uh, algorithm that we use is much, much easier of an analysis and much more accurate um, than just using the standard FFT on the stator current. So continuing on, in step three, after we take a look at the Fourier transform, we calculate the fault frequencies for each of the three fault types using the formulas that we looked at a little bit ago. This is a snapshot of the ESA FFT taken using the, the eight series setup software. You can see all the flagged fault frequencies. Again, uh, we show you this version of the FFT regardless of the relay firmware for visual simplicity. This, this is an actual screenshot from one of our customer installations running older firmware. So you can see um, double the number of fault frequencies flagged than you would if you had the latest version, but all the same. Um, the bearing frequencies are marked in red. The uh, mechanical are black, kind of laced in between here. And the stator frequencies are the two purple groups here. Again, you see groups of three, remember, because we took K equals one, two, and three. Once we have the fault frequencies identified, then we do the data collection. Again, a few changes here. What we used to look at uh, is the magnitude value exactly at each fault frequency, which makes it reliant on exact accuracy in the calculations you know, hoping we have an exact fault frequency calculation. Now we look at a small range centered around that calculated fault frequency, and we take the highest magnitude that we find within that range. So it's a little bit more forgiving. Then we normalize that magnitude to the motor's rated full load amps magnitude to make the values conceptually easier to compare. We used to normalize all the signals to the fundamental, but that leaves us susceptible to load variations that'll change that, that value, uh, whereas the motor's rated FLA will always be constant. So that's basically what we're saying in step four here. Take the highest magnitude at each fault frequency and normalize it to the FLA. 
then in step five, we register for each of the three fault categories what frequency has the highest value, and then we store that as the peak magnitude value for that category. So in total, we'll have three peak, mag peak magnitude values stored. And then just as a double checking mechanism, we also do what we call an energy calculation, um, which we take as the RMS of three values near the peak fault frequency, um, the ratio of that to the FLA, and then the log magnitude. The idea with this is that if the peak magnitude value increases, then this associated energy value should also increase. If there's no correlation, then something's probably wrong. So in the metering value screens, we do show both the peak magnitude and energy values for each category, but the only thing you should really be concerned about are the peak magnitude values. The energy calculations are more of a back-end a back verification for us. In step six, in the relay settings, there's an option for a baseline period. For however long this period is set, while the motor is in service and running, we continually take a recording of the peak magnitude values that we calculate repeatedly per the last step. Then at the end of the period, we average all the values to get what we'll use as our baseline values for subsequent monitoring. We do this baselining separately for what we call each load bin. A load bin is defined as 10% chunks of the operating load, basically what you see in this pie here. So for example, if you're at 75% load, you'd be operating in load bin eight. The idea is that certain characteristics are load dependent, so you'd probably inherently see different frequency magnitudes as you go up in load. And we don't want to falsely think that this is the change, that this changes the fault when it's actually not. So every time the motor significantly changes in load, we record another baseline register for that specific load bin. So in total, we might have up to 12 different, so we have 12 different load bins in total, and we could potentially have 12 different groups of baseline recordings. And the recording doesn't need to be all at once. If the motor starts, stops, or sees a change in load, we'll dynamically switch between the load bin registers and record what we see in segments until the entire register is full. Once we see a total of the set baseline period recorded, then we'll switch into monitoring mode. When we're finally in monitoring mode, here's where we continuously do a comparison. We take the baseline recorded values, which are assumed to be the healthy motor values, that's the blue curve shown here, and we compare that to the currently sampled values the red curve here. For the identified fault frequencies, we look at what the difference between these two values are. And if this difference exceeds the pickup set point we entered, and this difference is present for the duration of the time delay that we set, then, we, then an alarm is triggered on the relay that gives the user an indication that something is wrong and the motor should be looked at. And that's basically all there is to the ESA feature procedural wise. So we do all these fancy calculations and analysis. What you're probably more interested in is what information do we provide to you? What can you see from it? If you look under the metering values menu in the 8 series setup software, you can see options for the baseline monitoring for each of the three ESA categories and the monitoring values for each of those categories. If we open these up, 
In this example, we're going to open the bearing fault values. You can see for the baseline what the average peak magnitude values were, again, including up to the third harmonic. Um, you can see for the baseline, uh, sorry again, for the baseline, you can see what the average normal peak magnitude values are. And then you can also see what those average energy values were again as a double checking mechanism. Um, once the baseline recording is complete and we switch into monitoring mode, then we go over to this monitoring window here. This screen will update and it'll show you the values based on the latest sampling. So what you're interested in here are the normalized peak values shown at the top. Um, we take these values, we compare them to the values you see in the baseline window, and this change value is stored in the highlighted max change uh, register. So that's this area here. So these max change values are the actual operating quantities. These values are what need to exceed the set pickup for the ESA function to alarm. Ideally, you want to see values like this that are close to zero, which means that there's been no deterioration seen in the motor. Uh, again, we show you what load bin we're currently operating in. In the monitoring values, we also show you the speed, um, the time that the baseline was recorded, and the time of the last fault computation. One thing that I didn't mention here, uh, it's not shown in this window, uh, since this is an older screenshot, is the max standard deviation peak magnitude value which is included in the baseline uh, recording. Um, this basically gives us an indication of how much variation there was in the magnitude sampled during the baseline recording. Uh, it could provide an indication of how accurate the baseline values might be. Ideally, you'd want the baseline readings to be consistent. And in that case, a small deviation value would be seen. If you have a really high standard deviation value, that might mean the accuracy of the ESA element inherently might not be as great. And just to note, all the values you see here, you can also see directly on the relay front display. So what if a fault happens? What would you see? Here we're looking at the values for the stator category. Uh, on the left again is the recorded baseline values. And on the right, we have the monitoring screen, which I've condensed a little bit for clarity. If there's no fault, everything's normal. You can see both the normalized, uh, the normalized and energy peak magnitudes are fairly close to negative 100, which remember is a good thing. This means that there's barely any signal there compared to the fundamental. And these values compared to the baseline values are pretty close. You can say the max change value is pretty close to zero, so no issue here. If a fault were to occur, you should see something like this bottom screen where you can see the magnitudes have increased quite a bit. And this is reflected in the max change values that show a change of about 28 and 25 decibels. Ideally, the pickup settings would be set somewhere around a 20 decibel change. So in this case, if this change value is sustained for some time, then the ESA stator element would have picked up an alarm that something's wrong. I mentioned before that you can actually see the Fourier transform that we look at. 
This can be found under, if you're online, under the motor M and D option, records, and the ESA record option. If you double click on this, it'll open the FFT window like this. Um, here we'll show you the FFT from the most recent calculation, again, with all the fault frequencies flagged. Um, you can screenshot it like I did here, or you can download it in a CSV file format but so that you can see the values in table format or plot it elsewhere. If you're using the newer firmware and you want to see the actual I squared based signal that we use in the background, you can also get that by downloading the relay service report, uh, which I'll show you in a few slides. We don't show it to you directly in the software since most people aren't used to seeing the spectrum represented that way. And we wanted to make this as simple as possible to look at up front. If you did have a fault occurrence pickup, you can also see a last pickup FFT that was stored at the time of the event. Um, this screenshot is a case where we were actually using a test set to simulate a fault. So the signal looks pretty clean, but you would see something really similar to this where um, if there's a fault, that fault frequency magnitude value would show up as a pretty big spike. Again, you can save this to the file. You can save this as a CSV file if you want and graph it elsewhere or screenshot it like we did here. Another record that we provide is the historical log. This log stores up to 4,800 entries or 50 days worth of data. Every 15 minutes or when an event occurs, the relay will store a snapshot of all the values we looked at to this log. Um, you can find this log in the same menu as before uh, under ESA historical log. Um, and you can also download this file in CSV format so you can plot it, plot it in another table if you'd like. And also when you connect to the relay using the setup software, the software does automatically pull and back up this entire file to your computer. Um, the file's automatically saved to a predefined GE directory on your PC. Aside from allowing you to see what's going on over time, this log can give you an indication of how widely your readings fluctuate if you were to look through all of these. If your motor has regular fluctuating frequency magnitudes or if they generally stay pretty consistent, you should be able to see that if you look through all of them. This could help you to tune, uh, tune in the pickup settings to lower values. Uh, while avoiding false pickups. Normally, we set it kind of conservatively to start, and then you can adjust based on what you're seeing here. Something new in firmware 2.7 is we added this motor ESA trend charts option. These trend charts basically graph the historical log values for each of the three fault categories so that you can more easily visualize how the values are fluctuating over time. If they seem to be slowly increasing, which could mean a problem may be creeping up, or if everything is staying relatively consistent. The last metering screen we have for the ESA function is what we call the ESA circle. This is that pie chart that I displayed earlier. You can see the circle separated into 12 different load bins. Uh, during, during operating in any given load bin, when you open this chart, it'll show one dot that represents the calculated max change value. The radial direction here is increasing magnitude value. The edge of the blue circle represents what the baseline magnitude is. The edge of the green circle is the first pickup value magnitude that we set, which is your early warning. And the edge of the orange is the second pickup value that we set, 
which is your real, hey, something's wrong alarm. So the, the current samples max, max change dot will fall on this chart according to the present operating load bin. So it'll be in one of these pie slices uh, and according to what that max change value is. This basically gives you a visual indication of what we saw in the initial metering value screens. Um, there's one of these charts for each of the three fault categories. You can't save these ones to file, but you can always take a screenshot of them. Um, in firmware 2.7, we also added to this so that if you have enough historical data points logged, then on this chart here, we'll plot up to the last 10 ch max change points. So that if the trajectory of the value seems to be increasing, um, you can kind of see it creeping outwards like this. Just an example, here's a screenshot I took from a relay and service running the ESA feature. You can see uh, the max change value is right around the baseline radius, so everything looks good here. And then you can see the drop down menu, or you can select which of the three circles you want to look at. And in this example, you can see the points heading out outwards indicating a barren fault. So you can see originally it was that baseline, then it entered the uh, initial fault stage, and then it entered the really bad fault stage. So definitely if you saw something like this, you know you need to take a look at it. So if a fault were to occur, you'd see an alarm directly on the relays display. Here we're showing an example of the sequence of event recorder screen. You can see the bearing fault function picked up on its stage one warning, and then right after it picked up on stage two. And then after the set time delay, uh, they both officially alarmed. Uh, so this message would look similar for the other categories. Instead of bearing, it would say something like uh, stator fault or mechanical fault, but similar types of alarms. And this would directly pop up on your target screen as well. In the latest firmware, we also added a new ESA health report option that you can download using the setup software. This report gives you a three page summary of all the metering values for each of the three categories, uh, the calculated fault frequencies, and a snapshot of the FFT. And it also highlights any anomalies that occur. And you can download this as a PDF file. So that's under uh, the maintenance ESA health report option. What we normally suggest, especially when you contact us for assistance with anything, is to download the relay service report. So in the setup software, in the top left area of the window, you would see this panel here. Um, the, the service report option is this uh, wrench with paper icon. Um, if you click this option, it downloads a zip file from the relay that contains just about everything. It's a pretty big file. It has a copy of the relay settings file, the event records, any waveforms, motor start records, motor learn data, a screenshot of the relay's HMI so we can see if any error messages are displayed or otherwise what the metering values are, and so on. And now in firmware 2.7, We've added all the all the ESA log info to the service report. So when you download the service report, you'll get just about everything we talked about automatically pulled, again, except for the ESA circle. All right, so just really quick, we'll go over some of the ESA settings just for reference. Again, if you guys ever run into one of these applications and you need some help, 
uh, with setting up the settings or understanding what to set, definitely let us know and we can help you. Uh, to start with, to, to actually order the ESA function, again, if you open the order code configurator, ESA is under monitoring and it would be that extended uh, monitoring option that notes the ESA function. This is a software updatable option. So if you have an existing relay, uh, I believe above firmware 2.4, is when we added it initially, then um, you can actually contact us, purchase the additional option, and we can give you a file to update the software option on that relay and update the order code. When it comes to the settings, uh, there's just a few windows that you need to look at. The first is obviously we need to have all of your motor information properly set. So under the system menu, motor, motor setup, you'll see a window like this. And specifically for ESA, what we're interested in getting accurately set is the motor FLA, the motor nameplate voltage, the horsepower, speed, number of poles, and the rated efficiency. With the newer firmware, uh, these last two aren't as critical. Um, we definitely need this top group though. And then quite simply, I'm sure you'll have this set up anyway, but under system power system, we also use this nominal frequency set point. The other window you need to look at is of course, the actual ESA settings window itself. This is the only other window you need to see and set up. So that's under set points, monitoring ESA. Um, you can put in the uh, motor manufacturer. This is just for your reference. We don't do anything with this information. Uh, the next three settings are the function. You can choose to enable or disable them. Generally, if you, unless you have something uh, particular, like you have bearing sleeves, for example, all of these would be enabled. Uh, if you have, let's say, sleeve bearings, you would disable this because we don't support sleeve bearings. The data quality check setting I mentioned earlier, Generally, you would leave this enabled unless you have a special circumstance that prevents you from doing so, like you have no VTs, for example. Otherwise, it's default to enabled. Then we have the two baseline settings. Uh, this is something that we updated in firmware version 2.7 as well. The period options used to be something like 24 and 48 hours. Uh, now we've left it configurable anywhere from one to 300 minutes, uh, which is particularly useful if you're trying to test this out during commissioning, for example. You can set this baseline period really low just to have something stored and then see it in monitoring mode and see you know, what you can do in monitoring mode, all the screens you can see from it. Um, and then after that, you can clear the records and then uh, up this to something more usual, like 60 minutes is the recommended minimum and then put the relay back in service. Um, so when you're putting in this in service, we recommend a minimum of 60 minutes. Uh, if it's a newer motor, 60 minutes is probably sufficient. If it's an older motor, we would generally recommend that you put this longer, like say 24 hours, if you can do so, uh, just so that we accurately get that spectrum baseline. Uh, you would set the baseline mode to enabled unless you don't want the ESA function to be functioning. Um, generally, you would just leave it at enabled. Another couple setting options we added in firmware 2.7 are the voltage type and the motor type. Uh, the voltage type is what kind of VTs you have wired to the relay. So if you have three phase VTs, a single phase VT, or if you have no VT. Um, we ran into a few customers who were applying this on motors that they did not have VTs for. Uh, 
um, which in the older algorithm, um, some of the calculations included voltage, so they couldn't use some things. Here we have the options, so if you choose something like no VT, uh, then we adjust it accordingly. So we have this option added here, and then we also added an option for the motor type. Again, we can support induction motors. If it's on a simple induction motor, you would choose this option. If you have a VFD fed induction motor, you would choose VFD induction. And we also support synchronous motors, in which case you would leave this as is, but make sure um, in the, the actual motor setup settings that we saw in the last slide that you set up the motor type as synchronous motor, and then the ESA will take a look at it accordingly. The next handful of settings here are more motor information. These need to be obtained from the motor data sheets, and these generally aren't from the standard data sheets. You might need to go back to the motor manufacturer and ask for more info. These would be things like the number of rolling elements in your bearings, uh, the cage diameter of the bearings, uh, and the rolling element ball diameter. Again, these are directly from the bearing data sheets. Um, and then often you can find the number of stator slots on your general data sheets. Now, the meat of the settings, as I mentioned earlier, are these pickup values and the delays. So you see we have pickups and delays for each of the three categories for bearing, mechanical, and stator. For each of these, we have a stage one, which is an early warning pickup, along with the, the delay for stage one, and then a stage two pickup, which is more of a serious warning, along with the associated delay for that stage two pickup. So generally, we would recommend that you leave the settings at the default 45 and 55 max change value dBs to start with. This is more on the conservative side. And then once you have this in service and you have some good data, you can go back and see what your typical values are and then adjust these down accordingly. Typical fault values tend to be around in the, the 20 to 25-ish range. So uh, in some settings, we have a 20 decibel pickup for an early warning and then 25 for the stage two warning. Uh, again, with a 10 minute and 50 minute delay. But again, we recommend you leave as is for now until you actually have good data to look at. So in terms of setting, aside, aside from putting your uh, motor information, there's really not anything that you need to calculate. It's very simple to set up. This is all you need to do. Once you enable all of this, the relay will go to work um, and you just need to take a look at the metering screens once in a while uh, and see what's going on. So basically, this was just explaining those pickup settings. Now, if you were to do any sort of testing on the ESA function, so you had some baseline values recorded that not, might not necessarily be applicable anymore, or if you took this relay out and put it on a different motor, uh, that motor would have different characteristics, obviously. So in that case, if you still want to use ESA, you can clear all the ESA data that's been stored. You can clear all the baseline recordings and the actual operational data. You can wipe out everything and then start from scratch again. So this option is available. And then the last thing I wanted to go over is a few ESA case studies that we have. So I think this was actually uh, Mike's customer. So if you have anything to Mike to add, Mike, feel free. Um, but he had a materials plant uh, in Florida in his region that had uh, e ESA option installed on the 869, and it picked up with a bearing fault alarm. Um, they said they went out and looked at the motor 
everything looked fine, the bearings looked fine, they don't know what the relay is talking about. So they went back, they looked at all the records, they saw this max change value was somewhere around 20 decibels in their historical log. This is what the relay picked up on. Um, and then when they actually did an ultrasound test, they actually found that there was a very small crack in one of the uh, bearing balls. So the 869 ESA option caught a failure that wasn't even noticeable to the eye. So we were able to catch an incipient fault successfully. Another event that one of our colleagues uh, presented at a IEEE pulp and paper event was a customer who had ESA. They separately graphed all these values like you show here in a separate piece of software. But what happened was they were in normal operating mode. The 869 uh, operated an ESA alarm here for bearing faults. The customer did not look at the alarm values. They just let it run, didn't notice anything was wrong. So the 869 continued to gather data and we can see that the fault values are continuously getting worse and worse and worse until a catastrophic failure. And this is the FFT screenshot from that same application. We can see uh, at a specific frequency that there was a spike and this is what we alarmed on for a bearing failure. All right, so that concludes what we had to present today. Let's see if we have any questions left over. Hey, Christine, it's Mike. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions and I think more popular that I came up with is the ESA, what type of motors does it work on? Um, indu induction, sync, VFDs and such. Can you just clarify that? Sure. So on firmware versions prior to 2.7, so anything that was purchased prior to last week, then that those ones support only induction motors. We don't officially support synchronous motors or VFD driven motors prior to 2.7. With the changes that we added in 2.7, we now support induction motors, synchronous motors, and VFD driven motors. So you can use this on just about any type of motor. I guess what I could add is just be careful on the synchronous motor. If you have two poles, yes. your fault frequency might land up on the fundamental frequency. Um, the other thing was um, there was some confusion about the different graphs and data that you showed, you know, what's contained in each of them, like the historical data versus the ESA circle and so on. Can you go through a little bit sure. review on that? Yeah. So in the records menu, we have several different options. Um, here we're showing the FFT option. So this is where you can see what fault frequencies are flagged. You can see them all labeled down here. We show you the fundamental and then the complete frequency spectrum that we see from the current uh, stator sample. So what we're looking for in here is any, basically any spikes at those specific fault frequencies. Um, this is all recorded in the background, but we just give this to you visually so you can take a look at this if you'd like. So this is basically the waveform that we're analyzing. We also provide a version of this for the last pickup. So again, it's basically the same thing, um, but if you had a pickup event, we separately store this one so that it's saved so that you can go back and see where that spike was at what frequency. The historical log again is basically just a, a large data logger. So every 15 minutes, we'll take a sample of what the readings are. Uh, and we'll, we will store all of those peak magnitude values, the energy values, all the change values, um, what load bin we're operating in, uh, all the motors running characteristics, 
basically all the operational info in the historical log. So that's stored every 15 minutes, and that's for if you want to go back and actually look at the values. This is the only place where you can see past values. If you look in any of the metering screens, you'll see what the current sampled values are. This new trend chart feature, this basically just graphs what we saw in the historical log. It directly takes the historical log features and graphs them. So you can see if there's any trending going on, if the values are increasing or if they're staying the same. Um, it basically just gives you a much easier way to view the historical log so you don't necessarily need to go through every entry and kind of kind of determine if it's increasing or not, or um, you don't have to graph them separately in a different software. We'll give you that graph up front now. And then the ESA circle, it's just an additional vis visual representation to make it a little bit easier for you to know if everything's okay or if the values seem to be trending outward. Um, I guess it's kind of similar to the trend charts that we provide now. Um, it's just another way of showing what the values are. So if everything's good, you'll see a dot representing the max change value in the blue or green area. If something's wrong, then you'll see the value trend towards the alarm area, and then you'll know something's wrong. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Mike? No, thanks. I mean, for the most part, for most of the installations that we have installed at the moment, Generally, um, you'd put it in service and then you would just leave it run and make sure there's no alarm that shows up on the front display saying an ESA operation occurred. Uh, some people actually uh, pull the Modbus registers for those alarms and they just look to see if an alarm comes up that way. Um, you don't actually need to go in and look at any of these screens unless you specifically want to see what's going on uh, in more detail. Otherwise, the relay will give you an alarm when something happens. It'll be pretty obvious. Um, another question was, um, can you retrofit an 8469 with an 869 with ESA? So the answer to that is no. Or sorry, uh, can we, Mike? Um, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to, right? I mean, we the voltages and currents are really the only thing that we need to monitor. Yeah, I think, sorry, originally I thought the question was about SPM for some reason. With the no, SPM, no. you can't retrofit. Right. Uh, the SPM to the 869 because the interface is completely different. Um, the 469 does have a retrofit kit. Uh, the 869 has a retrofit kit for the 469. Like you said, I don't see any reason why we couldn't retrofit it since there's no additional wiring, um, but we'd have to get back to you to see if that's an orderable option with the retrofit kit. I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be though. Um, someone asked if ESA works on wound rotor motors. I believe the answer to that is no, but if you can send us your contact info, uh, we can definitely get back to you with an answer on that. Regarding the SPM, a question that I commonly receive is, can the 869 without the SPM option be used for synchronous motor protection still? And the answer to that one is no, 
Um, the 869 needs to have the hardware option for synchronous motor inputs, but you can use it the other way around, which is good if you want to standardize on a part number, if you have a variety of motors. Um, you can always select the SPM option on all the relays, and then there's a setting where, where you can specify whether it's an induction motor or synchronous motor. So you can disable all those synchronous motor options if you're putting it on an induction motor. And then another question I often get is, when do we need to use start sequence control and power factor regulation in the relay? And the answer to that is that it depends on your synchronous motor controls. If it's a large motor, it likely has its own controls built in and you don't need to do this separately in the relay or you can use the relay just as a backup. But if it's a smaller motor, it probably doesn't have its own controls, in which case uh, you can have the 869 do this for you. Um, there was another question, and I know the historical records um, capture data every 15 minutes. How, how often does the ESA actually do a calculation? Do I believe the ESA calculation is done every one minute. So if you actually had this ESA circle diagram open, for example, you would see it refresh every one minute with the updated information. So we the, the actual calculation is done every one minute and then the historical log averages all of those minutes or all, the, all of those samples over the 15 minutes and stores it in a log every 15 minutes. And I guess you could take this final question here. What is the time period from the record and the blue line to the red line? I guess they're referring to the ESA circle. So what is the time period from here to here? Uh, so this, this pie chart is not time-based at all. This is simply um, the decibel value. So as we go outwards, in the radius, we're increasing in the magnitude value. So here would be zero dB, for example. This blue line is drawn at your baseline decibel value, um, which is shown in the legend here. So this point would be minus 80. Um, at the end of the green point, uh, this would be your first pickup level. So if we have our first pickup level set to a change value of 10, then it would be the baseline plus 10. So this would be 90 decibels here. Um, the outside of the orange area is the second pickup. So it would be your baseline plus the first pickup plus the second pickup. So 80 plus 10 plus 15 would be this area here. Um, and then after here, kind of a moot point. After here, you're basically you know, in trouble. Um, the time isn't accounted for on here. Basically, you need to have this value rise above the pickup level for the set period of time. And if it stays consistent for that set period of time, then we'll, we'll alarm. All right, anything else to add, guys? Any more questions? If you have any last minute questions, feel free to paste it in the Q&A box. Christine, there is a question about uh, does that the load, the loading on the motor affect the readings? Um, and they're also asking about reciprocating loads like a compressor or a centrifugal pump. Any comments on that? Generally for reciprocating loads, for example, um, in the motor setup settings, you would set, uh, I think it's the load averaging filter that would take care of um, 
basically smoothing out that current waveform in the relay. It's, it doesn't necessarily affect ESA per se. Um, the only thing that ESA is really looking at is what load level you're currently operating in. Um, I don't know if Paul or Mike, you have anything to add to that. I don't think it makes a huge difference. Right, I, I took it to mean, does it affect the the ESA? But but I, I think you're right, they're two, they are two different things. Um, don't really affect each other. So Eduardo had to, uh, had to step away for a couple of minutes and he asked me to to close out the training uh, since we're at the at the top of the hour I, I can go ahead and do that i'm not sure that uh, that any of us can actually stop the presentation though so i don't know christine you want to keep answering questions uh, let's see here yeah if you guys have well, more questions feel free to well, if all the presenters leave, then <laughs> we can automatically close the session. So, uh, so to to get a uh, uh, question about CEUs, you would uh, send an email, um, I guess, to Eduardo or whoever whoever you signed up, um, whoever sent you the notice to sign up for the meeting. You can send a request to them, and they will get you a. Uh, a copy of the the training certificate as well as the presentation if you need it yeah i don't yeah i don't see anything else technical in here maybe everybody left um yeah i think yeah i don't know how we can close this now because it's still recording <laughs>